Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Marco Island Sunday. Um, today, our worship will be led by Pastor Rich Kirshner, who I will introduce you to in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to make you aware of some announcements. Um, for starters, call it a late April Fool's joke, or um, maybe I just had too much confusion with the Easter holiday. But there will be communion at today's service, despite it not being in your bulletins. So, between the serving and or between the sermon and the closing hymn, go ahead and count for the fact that we will be taking communion, and of course, all are welcome to the table when we do that. This afternoon, we welcome the Paradise Coastman Barbershop Chorus into our sanctuary at 4 p.m. for an a cappella concert. There's no ticket purchase necessary, but there will be a free, offering, free will offering at the event. Um, bring neighbors, friends, it's gonna be a fun Sunday afternoon event. As John Campbell tells me, there is a big game on this afternoon, but I promise you, you can watch it afterwards. <laughs> Tomorrow, the Women's Fellowship will gather for their final program of the season. If you'd like to join them for lunch at 11.30, just kindly bring $5 to cover the cost. The program itself will begin at 1 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, and will be joined by Keith Maples, Chief Development Officer at the Neighborhood Health Clinic. This is a mission that UCMI has supported for many years. Um, Ginny Rapp and David Sorer will also join us to share how they contribute their time and energy to this wonderful mission. And now I'm gonna pass the microphone to Chrissy so she can share a little bit about her Senior Blue Book event. Hi everyone. So um, a week from tomorrow on April 15th from 12 to 1.30 is our final Seniors Blue Book Lunch and Learn. There's a little, pro a little paper in the back with the information. Um, the topic for this month, it's the final one of our season, is smart money, planning for retirement, and long-term care. Um, so it's kind of a good way to pre-plan, and there'll be um, a panel of experts kind of explaining some ways to make the most of your money in retirement. Um, and you have to RSVP, so just copy the phone number on the flyer in the back. I'm also trying to get people to sign up. I'm in the process of arranging a CPR and AED defibrillator class. The fire department is gonna put it on for us, for Bargain Basket and our church. And so if you are interested, I have to get um, a number of people before I set the date. It should be hopefully in the next few weeks. So if you are interested, please let me know as soon as possible. Um, it is a a Good Samaritan class, so there's no test. It's just kind of to familiarize yourself in the event of an emergency, you would be able to help. So just let me know ASAP if you are interested. And now I'd like to formally introduce Reverend Rich Kirshner. Pastor Rich was the Executive Associate Minister at First United Methodist Church in Naples from 2002 to 2014. <laughs> Now retired, Rich attends Naples UCC and serves as chair of its Board of Christian Education. He has also recently served as district governor for Rotary Clubs throughout Southwest Florida. Pastor Rich, we are so pleased and honored to have you here with us today. Thank you for being here. <laughs> to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And in that spirit of worship, let us greet one another in the name of Christ.
Join me in the call to worship. Joyful praise is God's promise. Here's the song, our hearts in worship. Inspiration from the scriptures is God's promise. Faith, community, and friendship is God's promise. As we build each other up, Christ's family will increase. The loving spirit is God's promise. The will lead us to the peace that cannot be taken away. Let us stand for our opening hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Let us pray together. God of life, forgive our denial of life, our destruction of its hopes, our denial of its needs, our distorting of its possibilities. Fill us with your spirit of life, that we might be people of life, servants of life, encouragers of life, signs of Christ, the life of the world. In his name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I just want you to know that I'm fortunate enough this morning to sing with my father and my mother. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I have learned this morning that your congregation has completed its Easter offering, and the collection will be given uh, through the admissions committee to the Marco Island Charter Middle School next Sunday. And so you'll want to be here for that presentation. And as you make your gifts to this United Church, whether it's online or in person, the baskets are in the back of the sanctuary. And be sure that you know that your gifts help others to get a little taste of what the kingdom of heaven is like here on earth. This church is supported by the generosity of each one of you each of you as representing God's people. And you should be, and I am grateful, for the generosity of this church, because I know of your reputation for that. So it's in that spirit of generous generosity that we all stand together and we join in singing the doxology.
Hi again. I have a couple of prayer requests. Um, Cindy Johnson has asked for prayers for her son, Troy, who had a very busy week at the hospital. He had a cardiac catheterization on Monday, open heart surgery for valve replacement on Tuesday, and a pacemaker placed on Friday. So Cindy shared with me that he was up and walking around the ICU this morning. So our prayers for continued healing for Troy and Cindy because she's a caregiver to everyone. And Linda James could also use our prayers as she was admitted to the hospital for testing and observation yesterday after a little bit of a health scare. Um, our prayers for good reports and healing so that she can come home soon. Thank you. Let us join together as I offer this morning's pastoral prayer. Loving and eternal God, we are grateful for the blessings of this congregation, for its friendships, for its community of love and purpose and service. We're thankful too for your presence with us in this hour and in all our days for your encouragement to one another in times of distress, for your word of hope when we need it most, for your gentle and sometimes prodding reminders of where we are and who is our neighbor. On this Sunday, we are mindful of the beauty of your creation and its mystery. For tomorrow, so many of us and, and people around the world will be gathered to look up at the stars and the sun that you provide for our warmth and for our living on this planet. And yet we are mindful that this planet seems to grow smaller each and every day. We are tormented by hunger and disease, by war, by racism, by our inability to see one another as you see us. Open our hearts that we might know that our neighbor not only sits next to us, but is just a short plane flight across the globe. That you have given us the opportunity to serve one another and to save one another. For you gave us the possibility that if each one would look after one, that all of humanity would grow and be blessed. We are mindful, too, of the prayers of, and concerns of each one of us, the concerns on our hearts, those things that bring us distress and worry. Take those moments of worry and calm us, calm our fears, and bring us to moments of joy as we hear the music and share in a meal this morning. May they be the slight and small blessings that get us through the day and through the week, that we might have open eyes and open ears and open hearts for the people you send our way. For these prayers and for your many blessings to us, we offer this prayer in your many names. Amen.
Today's scripture is from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will row the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Judy, for reading that a second week in a row. (laughs) I'm sure when you um, just heard that, you thought to yourself, that's not what I expected to hear. I heard that last week, and so did I. In many churches across the country, that was the lectionary uh, gospel reading for Easter Sunday. And so I listened uh, to many sermons last Sunday in churches that I've been a part of to hear how they were um, using that particular scripture. Now, I want to remind you that this is considered, the first Sunday after Easter is often considered a low Sunday. Do you know why it's called a low Sunday? Because the amount of people attending church the Sunday after Easter gets a little low. But it's my favorite Sunday. Over the years, uh, I served in many capacities in churches, but my favorite was being the associate pastor, who was always given the Sundays after the holidays. But I didn't consider them low. I considered them Sundays in which people had the opportunity to hear and to consider what they had heard before, or maybe didn't hear it quite so well. Last Sunday, in all the churches that we participate in, there's great music, more music than ever, that lifts our spirits. There's flowers and there's scents wafted through the sanctuaries, and we are in our finest dress, and we're glad to see families, and all that celebration takes place. But on the next Sunday, we have to act as Easter people, and that's what we are today. When I first heard this story many years ago, I was about 14 years old, I think. And it was on a Sunday night, it was Palm Sunday actually, and our youth group had gathered together and we usually did a lot of fun things together. And of course, the reason that all the boys came to this group of about 70 was because all the girls came to this group. (laughs) On that particular Sunday night though, the pastor divided us up into groups and ask us to consider the Easter story, the resurrection story, from each one of the four Gospels. My group had this passage, and we read it out loud, and then we were to come back and give our um, initial reactions to that. Well, we all sort of argued as to who was going to speak for our group, and finally, one of the members of the group, one of my boyhood friends, said, well, I'll speak for our group. And when it came time to talk about what he learned in that resurrection story, he said to everybody else in the group, when we read that, that wasn't what I expected to hear. That the women went away afraid, 
and they said nothing to anyone. Now, if Hollywood was in charge of putting together that resurrection story, they would have rewritten it completely. I mean, here is a story where Jesus' resurrection appears for all the world to see. There's no lights or stars in the sky that say, I'm back. There's no Jesus going before Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the Jewish religious community and say, you thought you had me, I'm back. (laughs) Who did Jesus appear to? In all the Gospels, Jesus appeared in very different ways to people who had some faith in what he had said and what he had done and whose mourning for his death was heavy on their hearts. Many of the stories that we read in the Bible are, you know, they're, they're, they're stories where the endings aren't what we expect. We've heard them so many times that we do expect that that's the ending. But when we really think about the endings to many of the Bible stories, that's probably not the way you and I would have written them. One of my favorite stories is about Joseph and his brothers. And you know that Joseph was sold into slavery because his brothers were jealous of him and his relationship to his father. They threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. And many years later, when they are in a famine and dying of hunger, they travel to Egypt. And they meet him by accident and do not recognize him but he knows they are his brothers. And by the end of the story, just when you think that he is finally going to have his chance to get even, they have a reunion. And all is forgiven. Probably the most famous story in the Bible that everyone knows about and every guest preacher in any church talks about is the prodigal son. You know the story. A young man asks his father for his half of you know, his wealth, his inheritance. And he goes away, and he spends it on who knows what. But he goes through it. He's lived the life that he wanted to live, but he goes through it, and pretty soon he's eating with the pigs. And he comes to his senses, the Bible tells us. And he's going to go to his father. And on his way back to see his father, to see if he can at least be given the opportunity to be one of his father's servants, he thinks, here's what I'll say to my father. I'll go to my father and I'll say that I'm your son who has come back here because I need you. And you know, as he's coming back to his father's house, and along the way, his father goes and sees him at a distance and goes out and runs to him. If I was rewriting that story, I wouldn't do it that way. And maybe you wouldn't either. So here's how it would go. The son is coming home, and he's already figured out the speech he's going to give to his father so that he might get back into his father's good graces And so that he might at least have food and shelter and uh, maybe the chance of getting back into the family life. And as he approaches the home, he hears a lot of noise and singing and laughter. And as he comes to the gate of the home, one of his father's servants says, I think you might want to try the back door. And he says to the servant, what is going on here? And the servant says to the, to the one who went away, the prodigal son says, well, your father is hosting a wonderful dinner celebration because your brother saved the family business in a time of economic struggle and famine. Make more sense to you? Maybe you ought to go to the back door. Maybe you ought to lay a little low and not say much to your mother for a while. Don't let the neighbors get a chance to talk about where you might have been. It makes more sense. It's kind of what we would expect. It's kind of the way we live. 
So much of the Bible is like that. It's told in parables. And parables are riddles. They must have been welcome news for Jesus' hearers when they heard those parables, those stories about a woman looking for a lost coin or someone needing bread. Or perhaps that story when one of the disciples says, in terms of forgiveness, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? And Jesus says, no, seven times, seven times. I don't know about you, I have a hard time with the first time. And there are all kinds of stories like that in the Bible. And so when we hear that, we can proclaim easily, that's not what I expected to hear. And especially when it comes to forgiveness. I once spoke to a woman who told me that she had been seeing a therapist. And I said, you know, were, were there reasons for that? And she said, well, I've been having a lot of pain, physical pain, arthritis. It doesn't run in my family, but I've had it. And in talking to my therapist, he suggested that probably if I would talk to my estranged daughter, who I haven't talked to in 15 years, that just maybe the arthritis would lessen. And I said, well, how do you feel about that? And she said, I told him I'd rather have the arthritis. <laughs> that wasn't what I expected to hear. <laughs> Several years ago, at Vanderbilt University, where I did a little bit of graduate work, a man named James Lawson a United Methodist pastor who had been a student at Vanderbilt in the early 1960s, was asked to come back to the school to receive an honor, and a chair was named for him at the Divinity School. James Lawson in the early 60s was a student at the Divinity School who helped organize and teach peaceful protesting the sit-ins at the lunch counters in Nashville, the freedom riders who came on the buses south to integrate counters and facilities and try to move us to a better place. James Lawson was expelled from Vanderbilt University. He was expelled for not the sin of doing that training of young people in how to be nonviolent and for expressing his religious views about why that was important. No, he got under the skin of then President Harvey Branscombe because he had the audacity to play intramural football on the college grounds with white boys. And so Harvey expelled him. Harvey also saw to the firing of many of the faculty of the Divinity School from Vanderbilt, who then formed a new theological school in Ohio, where I attended and received my degree. So James Lawson was invited back, and it was a huge crowd that came, and a reporter from the Tennessean, the state newspaper, was there to see James get his honor. At the end, when the benediction was given and the organ was playing and people were still gathering around, a frail old gentleman walking unsteady with a cane came forward to James Lawson and he said, Jim, can you ever forgive me? And James said, I forgave you, Harvey, a long time ago. The reporter for the Nashville Tennessean in her article about that event said, I could not believe what I just heard. I didn't expect to hear that. For those of us that have ears to hear, as Jesus said, let us hear. Amen.
This morning we will celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion. The deacons will be serving you. You may come forward at their direction or if you need to be served in your seat, just raise your hand and let them know. But we are sharing in a sacrament that reflects the last time Jesus ate supper with his disciples. They were gathered as not just disciples, but as his friends, seated at a table together, where one of them would soon betray him. And on that night, Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. And then he gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks and he blessed it. And he said to his friends gathered at that table, Take and drink this, all of you. For this is the new blood of a new covenant in my name for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink this, and do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Most gracious God, Pour out your spirit on each one of us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the blessings of life and hope, that we may be the body of our risen Christ, now and always. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and all are welcome. Come, for all things are ready.
Before we hear the benediction and blessing, let us pray together. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table on this day where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now before I offer a blessing, let me tell you what a blessing you have been in my life on this day. And I want to bring you the greetings of my now pastor, Mark, your former pastor, who warned me about all of you. <laughs> we are so grateful that you trained him up so that he could be among us. And I know that he is still in your hearts and that your next pastor, whoever that may be, will find that you are a lay-led church and a church that can go on whether you have a named pastor or not. And that is so evident to me on this day. <clears throat> So I thank you for that blessing, and now may I offer one for all of you. On this day, may the blessing of Almighty God give you the strength and power to leave here, knowing of what you have seen and heard, that you can joyfully share it with your neighbor, whoever that may be, and that the peace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit will fill your lives and the lives of all you know from this day forward and always. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.